Now, please welcome the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden. And please welcome the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Let's begin the debate and let's start with the issue that voters consistently say is their top concern, the economy. President Biden, inflation has slowed, but prices remain high. Since you took office, the price of essentials has increased. For example, a basket of groceries that cost $100 then now costs more than $120. And typical home prices have jumped more than 30%. What do you say to voters who feel they are worse off under your presidency than they were under President Trump? We got to take a look at what I was left when I became president and what Mr. Trump left me. We had an economy that was in free fall. The pandemic was so badly handled. Many people were dying. All he said was, it's not that serious. Just inject a little bleach into your arm. You'll be all right. The economy collapsed. There were no jobs. Unemployment rate rose to 15 percent. It was terrible. And so what we had to do is try to put things back together again. And that's exactly what we began to do. We created 15,000 new jobs. <clears throat> we brought out in a, a position where we have 800,000 new manufacturing jobs. But there's more to be done. There's more to be done. Working class people are still in trouble. I come from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I come of household where the kitchen table, if the things weren't able to be met during the month, it was a, pr a problem. The price of eggs, the price of gas, the price of housing, the price of a whole range of things. That's why I'm working so hard to make sure I deal with those problems. And we're going to make sure that we reduce the price of housing. We're going to make sure we build two, two million new units. We're going to make sure we cap rents so corporate greed can't take over. The combination that I was left with in corporate greed is the reason why we're in this problem right now. In addition to that, we're in a situation where if you had to take a look at all that was done in his administration, he didn't do much at all. By the time he left, there were things were in chaos, literally chaos. And so we put things back together. We created, I said, those jobs. We make sure we had a situation where we now we brought down the price of prescription drugs, which is a major issue for many people, to $15 for, for uh, an insulin shot as opposed to $400. No senior has to pay more than $200 for any drug, all the drugs they can include beginning next year. And the situation is making, and we're going to make that available to everybody, all Americans. So we're working to bring down the price of around the kitchen table, and that's what we're going to get done. Thank you. President Trump? We had the greatest economy in the history of our country. Uh, we have never done so well. Every, everybody was amazed by it. Other countries were copying us. We got hit with COVID, and when we did, we spent the money necessary so we wouldn't end up in a Great Depression, the likes of which we had in 1929 by the time we finished. So we did a great job. We got a lot of credit for the economy, a lot of credit for the military and no wars and so many other things. Everything was rocking good. But the thing we never got the credit for and we should have is getting us out of that COVID mess. Uh, he created mandates that was a disaster for our country. But other than that, we had we had given them back a a country where the stock market actually was higher than pre-COVID and nobody thought that was even possible. Uh, the only jobs he created are for illegal immigrants and bounce back jobs, a bounce back from the COVID. He has not done a good job. He's done a poor job and inflation is killing our country. It is absolutely killing us. Thank you. President Biden. Well, look, the greatest economy in the world. He, he's the only one who thinks that, I think. I don't know anybody else who thinks that he had the greatest economy in the world. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, we find ourselves in a situation where his, his economy, he rewarded the wealthy. He had the largest tax cut in American history, $2 trillion. He raised a deficit larger than any president has in any one term. He's the only president other than Herbert Hoover who's had lost more jobs than he had when he began, since Herbert Hoover. The idea that he did something that was significant in the military. You know, when he was president, they were still killing people in Afghanistan. He didn't do anything about that. When he was president, we were still find ourselves in a position where you had a notion that we were this safe country. The truth is, I'm the only president this century that doesn't have any, this, this decade, that doesn't have any troops dying anywhere in the world like he did. 
Uh, President Trump, uh, I want to follow up if I can. You Am I allowed to respond to him? Well, I'm going to ask you a follow-up. You can do whatever you want with the minute that we give you. Um, I, I want to follow up. You, you want to impose a 10% tariff on all goods coming into the U.S. How will you ensure that that doesn't drive prices even higher? It's not going to drive them higher. It's just going to cause countries that have been ripping us off for years, like China and many others, in all fairness to China. It's going to just force them to pay us a lot of money, reduce our deficit tremendously, and give us a lot of power for other things. But he, would, he made a statement. The only thing he was right about is I gave you the largest tax cut in history. I also gave you the largest regulation cut in history. That's why we had all the jobs. And the jobs went down and then they bounced back. And he's taking credit for bounce back jobs. You can't do that. He also said he inherited 9% inflation. Now, he inherited almost no inflation and it stayed that way for 14 months. And then it blew up under his leadership because they spent money like a bunch of people that didn't know what they were doing, and they don't know what they were doing. It was the worst, probably the worst administration in history. There's never been. And as far as Afghanistan is concerned, I was getting out of Afghanistan, but we were getting out with dignity, with strength, with power. He got out. It was the most embarrassing day in the history of our country's life. President Trump, over the last eight years, under both of your administrations, the national debt soared to record highs. And according to a new nonpartisan analysis, President Trump, your administration approved $8.4 trillion in new debt. Well, so far, President Biden, you've approved $4.3 trillion in new debt. So former President Trump, many of the tax cuts that you signed into law are set to expire next year. You want to extend them and go even further, you say. With the U.S. facing trillion-dollar deficits and record debt, why should top earners and corporations pay even less in taxes than they do now? Because the tax cuts spurred the greatest economy that we've ever seen just prior to COVID. And even after COVID, it was so strong that we were able to get through COVID much better than just about any other country. But we spurred that tax spurred. Now, when we cut the taxes, as an example, the uh, corporate tax was cut down to 21% from 39% plus beyond that. Uh, we took in more revenue with much less tax, and companies were bringing back trillions of dollars back into our country. The country was going like never before, and we were ready to start paying down debt. We were ready to start using the liquid gold right under our feet, the oil and gas right under our feet. We were going to have something that nobody else has had. We got hit with COVID. We did a lot to fix it. I gave him an unbelievable situation with all of the therapeutics and all of the things that we came up with. We gave him something great. Remember, more people died under his administration, even though we had largely fixed it. More people died under his administration than our administration, and we were right in the middle of it, something which a lot of people don't like to talk about. But he had far more people dying than his administration. He did the mandate, which is a disaster, mandating it. The vaccine went out. He did a mandate on the vaccine, which is the thing that people most objected to about the vaccine. And he did a very poor job, just a very poor job. And I will tell you, not only poor there, but throughout the entire world, we're no longer respected as a country. They don't respect our leadership. They don't respect the United States anymore. We're like a third world nation between weaponization of his election, trying to go after his political opponent, all of the things he's done. We've become like a third world nation. And it's a shame. The damage he's done to our country and I'd love to ask him, and Will, why he allowed millions of people to come in here from prisons, jails, and mental institutions to come into our country and destroy our country. President Trump, we will get to immigration uh, later in this block. President Biden, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this question about the national debt. He had the largest national debt of any president for your career, number one. Number two, you got two trillion dollar tax cut benefited the very wealthy. Yeah, what I'm going to do is fix the tax system. For example, we have a thousand trillionaires in America. I mean, billionaires in America. And what's happening? They're in a situation where they, in fact, pay 8.2% taxes. If they just paid 24%, 25%, either one of those numbers, and they'd raise $500 million, billion dollars, I should say, in a 10 year period. We'd be able to right wipe out his debt. We'd be able to help make sure that all those things we need to do child care, elder care making sure that we continue to strengthen our health care system, making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the, uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you, President uh, Biden. President Trump? 
was right. He did beat Medicare. He beat it to death, and he's destroying Medicare because all of these people are coming in. They're putting them on Medicare. They're putting them on Social Security. They're going to destroy Social Security. This man is going to single-handedly destroy Social Security. These millions and millions of people coming in, they're trying to put them on Social Security. He will wipe out Social Security. He will wipe out Medicare. So he was right in the way he finished that sentence. And it's a shame. What's happened to our country in the last four years is not to be believed. Foreign countries, I'm friends with a lot of people. They cannot believe what happened to the United States of America. We're no longer respected. They, they don't like us. We give them everything they want, and they, they think we're stupid. They think we're very stupid people. What we're doing for other countries, and they do nothing for us. What this man has done is absolutely criminal. Thank you, President Trump. Dana? This is the first presidential election since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This morning, the court ruled on yet another abortion case, temporarily allowing emergency abortions to continue in Idaho, despite that state's restrictive ban. Former President Trump, you take credit for the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, which returned the issue of abortion to the states. Correct. However, the federal government still plays a role in whether or not women have access to abortion pills. They're used in about two-thirds of all abortions. As president, would you block abortion medication? First of all, the Supreme Court just approved the abortion pill, and I agree with their decision to have done that, and I will not block it. And if you look at this whole question that you're asking, a complex, but not really complex, 51 years ago, you had Roe v. Wade, and everybody wanted to get it back to the states, everybody, without exception, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, Everybody wanted it back, religious leaders. And what I did is I put three great Supreme Court justices on the court, and they happened to vote in favor of killing Roe v. Wade and moving it back to the states. This is something that everybody wanted. Now, 10 years ago or so, they started talking about how many weeks and how many of this, getting into other things. But every legal scholar throughout the world, the most respected, wanted it brought back to the states. I did that. Now the states are working it out. If you look at Ohio, it was a decision that was, it was a, an end result. It was a little bit more liberal than you would have thought. Uh, Kansas, I would say the same thing. Uh, Texas is different. Florida is different. But they're all making their own decisions right now. And right now, the states control it. That's the vote of the people. Like Ronald Reagan, I believe in the exceptions. I am a person that believes. And frankly, I think it's important to believe in the exceptions. Some people, you have to follow your heart. Some people don't believe in that. But I believe in the exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. I think it's very important. Some people don't. Follow your heart. But you have to get elected also. And because that has to do with other things. You've got to get elected. The problem they have is they're radical because they will take the life of a child in the eighth month, the ninth month, and even after birth. After birth, if you look at the former governor of Virginia, he was willing to do this. He said, we'll put the baby aside and we'll determine what we do with the baby, meaning we'll kill the baby. What happened is we brought it back to the states and the country is now coming together on this issue. It's been a great thing. Thank you. President Biden? It's been a terrible thing that you've done. The fact is that the vast majority of constitutional scholars supported Roe when it was decided. Supported Roe. And that was that's this idea that they were all against it is just ridiculous. And this is the guy who says the state should be able to have it. If we're in a state where in six weeks you don't even know whether you're pregnant or not, but you cannot see a doctor and have you and have him decide on what your circumstances are and you need help. The idea that states are able to do this is a little like saying we're going to turn civil rights back to the states. Let each state have a different rule. Look, there's so many young women who have been, including a young woman who just was murdered, and he, he went to the funeral. And the idea that she was murdered by, a, by, a, by an immigrant coming in and talk about that. Here's the deal. There's a lot of more young women being raped by their, by their in-laws, by their, by, by their spouses, brothers and sisters. By, it's, just, it's, it's just ridiculous. And they can do nothing about it. And they tried to arrest them on the cross state line. Thank you. There have been many young women murdered by the same people he allows to come across our border. We have a border that's the most dangerous place anywhere in the world, considered the most dangerous place anywhere in the world. 
And he opened it up, and these killers are coming into our country. And they are raping and killing women. And it's a terrible thing. As far as the abortion is concerned, it is now back with the states. The states are voting. And in many cases, the, it's frankly a very liberal decision. In many cases, it's the opposite. But they're voting, and it's bringing it back to the vote of the people, which is what everybody wanted, including the founders, if they knew about this issue, which, frankly, they didn't. But they would have been, everybody wanted brought back. Ronald Reagan wanted it brought back. He wasn't able to get it. Everybody wanted it brought back, and many presidents had tried to get it back. I was the one to do it. And again, this gives it the vote of the people, and that's where they wanted it. Every legal scholar wanted it that way. Staying on the topic of abortion, President Biden, seven states, I'll let you do that, uh, this is the same topic, seven states have no legal restrictions on how far into a pregnancy a woman can obtain an abortion. Do you support any legal limits on how late a woman should be able to terminate a pregnancy? I support it Roe v. Wade. It's had three trimesters. First time is between the woman and the doctor. Second time is between the doctor and an extreme situation. The third time is between the doctor, I mean, be between the, the woman and the state. The idea that the politicians, the, the, that the founders wanted the politicians to be the ones making decisions about a woman's health is ridiculous. That's the last, no politician should be making that decision. A doctor should be making those decisions. That's how it should be run. That's what you're going to do. And if I'm elected, I'm going to restore Roe v. Wade. That means he can take the life of the baby in the ninth month and even after birth, because some states, Democrat run, take it after birth. Again, the governor, former governor of Virginia, put the baby down, then we decide what to do with it. So he's, in, he's willing to, as we say, rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month and kill the baby. Nobody wants that to happen, Democrat or Republican. Nobody wants it to happen. That is simply not true. The Roe v. Wade does not provide for that. That's not the circumstance. Only the woman's life is in danger. She's going to die. That's the only circumstance in which that can happen. But we are not for late-term abortion, period. Period, period. The Roe v. Wade, you have late-term abortion. You can do whatever you want, depending on the state. You can do whatever you want. We don't think that's a good thing. We think it's a radical thing. We think the Democrats are the radicals, not the Republicans. For 51 years, that was the law. 51 years, Constance Scholarship said it was the right way to go. 51 years, and it was taken away because this guy put very conservative members on the Supreme Court. He takes credit for taking it away. What's he going to do? What's he going to do, in fact, if, if the MAGA Republicans, he gets elected, and the MAGA Republicans control the Congress, and they pass a universal ban on abortion, period, across the board, at six weeks or seven or eight or ten weeks, something very, very conservative. Is he going to sign that bill? I'll veto it. He'll sign it. Thank you. Let's turn now to the issue of immigration and border security. President Biden, a record number of migrants have illegally crossed the southern border on your watch. Overwhelming border states and overburdening cities such as New York and Chicago, and in some cases causing real safety and security concerns. Given that, why should voters trust you to solve this crisis? Because we worked very hard to get a bipartisan agreement that not only changed all of that, but made sure that we are in a situation where you had no circumstance where they could come across the border with the number of border police right now. We significantly increased the number of asylum officers. Significantly, by the way, the Border Patrol endorsed me, endorsed my position. In addition to that, we found ourselves in a situation where when he was president, he was taking, separating babies. Biden withdrawing after his last debate. Donald Trump now up against a new opponent. The candidates separated by the smallest of margins, essentially tied in the polls nationally and in the key battlegrounds, including right here in Pennsylvania, all still very much in play. The ABC News presidential debate starts right now. This is an ABC News special. The most consequential moment of this campaign, Kamala Harris. Together, we will chart a new way forward. Donald Trump. We will soon be a great nation again. Face to face, historic. The ABC News presidential debate. Here now, David Muir and Lindsey Davis. Good evening, I'm David Muir, and thank you for joining us for tonight's ABC News presidential debate. We want to welcome viewers watching on ABC 
and around the world tonight. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Donald Trump are just moments away from taking the stage in this unprecedented race for president. And I'm Lindsay Davis. Tonight's meeting could be the most consequential event of their campaigns with Election Day now less than two months away. For Vice President Kamala Harris, this is her first debate since President Biden withdrew from the race on July 21st. Of course, that decision followed his debate against President Donald Trump in June. Since then, this race has taken on an entirely new dynamic. And that brings us to the rules of tonight's debate. 90 minutes with two commercial breaks. No topics or questions have been shared with the campaigns. The candidates will have two minutes to answer questions, and this is the clock. That's what they'll be seeing. Two minutes for rebuttals and one minute for follow-ups, clarifications, or responses. There might Microphones will only be turned on when it's their turn to speak. No pre-written notes allowed. There is no audience here tonight in this hall at the National Constitution Center. This is an intimate setting for two candidates who have never met. President Trump won the coin toss. He chose to deliver the final closing statement of the evening. Vice President Harris selected the podium to the right. So let's now welcome the candidates to the stage. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Donald Trump. Kamala Harris, is that the debate? Thank you. Welcome to you both. It's wonderful to have you. It's an honor to have you both here tonight. Good evening. We are looking forward to a spirited and thoughtful debate. So let's get started. I want to begin tonight with the issue that voters repeatedly say is their number one issue, and that is the economy and the cost of living in this country. Vice President Harris, you and President Trump were elected four years ago, and your opponent on the stage here tonight often asks his supporters, are you better off than you were four years ago? When it comes to the economy, do you believe Americans are better off than they were four years ago? So I was raised as a middle class kid, and I am actually the only person on this stage who has a plan that is about lifting up the middle class and working people of America. I believe in the ambition, the aspirations, the dreams of the American people. And that is why I imagine and have actually a plan to build what I call an opportunity economy. Because here's the thing. We know that we have a, a shortage of, of homes and housing. And the cost of housing is too expensive for far too many people. We know that young families need support to raise their children, and I intend on extending a tax cut for those families of $6,000, which is the largest child tax credit that we have given in a long time, so that those young families can afford to buy a crib, buy a car seat, buy clothes for their children. My passion, one of them, is small businesses. I was actually, my mother raised my sister and me, but there was a woman who helped raise us. We call her our second mother. She was a small business owner. I love our small businesses. My plan is to give a $50,000 tax deduction to start up small businesses, knowing they are part of the backbone of America's economy. My opponent, on the other hand, his plan is to do what he has done before, which is to provide a tax cut for billionaires and big corporations, which will result in $5 trillion to America's deficit. My opponent has a plan that I call the Trump's sales tax, which would be a 20% tax on everyday goods that you rely on to get through the month. Economists have said that that Trump sales tax would actually result for middle class families in about $4,000 more a year because of his policies and his ideas about what should be the backs of middle class people paying for tax cuts for billionaires. President Trump, I'll give you two minutes. First of all, I have no sales tax. That's an incorrect statement. She knows that. Uh, we're doing tariffs on other countries. Other countries are going to finally, after 75 years, pay us back for all that we've done for the world. And the tariff will be substantial in some cases. I took in billions and billions of dollars, as you know, from China. In fact, they never took the tariff off because it was so much money they can't. It would totally destroy everything that they've set out to do. They're taking in billions of dollars from China and other places. They've left the tariffs on. When I had it, I had tariffs, and yet I had no inflation. Uh, look, we've had a terrible economy because inflation has, which is really known as a country buster, it breaks up countries. We have inflation like very few people have ever seen before, probably the worst in our nation's history. We were at 21 percent, but that's being generous because many things are 50, 60, 70 and 80 percent higher than they were just a few years ago. This has been a disaster for people, for the middle class, but for every class. On top of that, we have millions of people pouring into our country from 
prisons and jails, from mental institutions and insane asylums. And they're coming in and they're taking jobs that are occupied right now by African Americans and Hispanics and also unions. Unions are going to be affected very soon. And you see what's happening. You see what's happening with towns throughout the United States. You look at Springfield, Ohio. You look at Aurora in Colorado. They are taking over the towns. They're taking over buildings. They're going in violently. These are the people that she and Biden led into our country. And they're destroying our country. They're dangerous. They're at the highest level of criminality. And we have to get them out. We have to get them out fast. I created one of the greatest economies in the history of our country. I'll do it again and even better. We are going to get to immigration and border security during this debate, but uh, I would like to let Vice President Harris respond on the economy here. Well, I would love to. Let's talk about what Donald Trump left us. Donald Trump left us the worst unemployment since the Great Depression. Donald Trump left us the worst public health epidemic in a century. Donald Trump left us the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. And what we have done is clean up Donald Trump's mess. What we have done and what I intend to do is build on what we know are the aspirations and the hopes of the American people. But I'm going to tell you all in this debate tonight, you're going to hear from the same old tired playbook a bunch of lies, grievances, and name-calling. What you're going to hear tonight is a detailed and dangerous plan called Project 2025 that the former president intends on implementing if he were elected again. I believe very strongly that the American people want a president who understands the importance of bringing us together knowing we have so much more in common than what separates us, and I pledge to you to be a president for all Americans. President Trump will give you a minute here to respond. Number one, I have nothing to do, as you know, and as she knows better than anyone, I have nothing to do with Project 2025. Uh, that's out there. I haven't read it. I don't want to read it purposely. I'm not going to read it. This was a group of people that got together. They came up with some ideas, I guess some good, some bad. But it makes no difference. I have nothing to do. Everybody knows I'm an open book. Everybody knows what I'm going to do. Cut taxes very substantially and create a great economy like I did before. We had the greatest economy. We got hit with a pandemic. And the pandemic was not since 1917, where 100 million people died. Has there been anything like it? We did a phenomenal job with the pandemic. We handed them over a country where the economy and where the stock market was higher than it was before the pandemic came in. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. We made ventilators for the entire world. We got gowns, we got masks, we did things that nobody thought possible. And people give me credit for rebuilding the military, they give me credit for a lot of things, but not enough credit for the great job we did with the pandemic. But the only jobs they got were bounce back jobs. These were jobs bounce back, and it bounced back and it went to their benefit, but I was the one that created them. They know it, and so does everybody else. Vice President Harris, I'll let you respond. So, Donald Trump has no plan for you. And when you look at his economic plan, it's all about tax breaks for the richest people. I am offering what I describe as an opportunity economy. And the best economists in our country, if not the world, have reviewed our relative plans for the future of America. What Goldman Sachs has said is that Donald Trump's plan would make the economy worse. Mine would strengthen the economy. What the Wharton School has said is Donald Trump's plan would actually explode the deficit. 16 Nobel laureates have described his economic plan as something that would increase inflation and by the middle of next year would invite a recession. You just have to look at where we are and where we stand on the issues. And I'd invite you to know that Donald Trump actually has no plan for you because he is more interested in defending himself than he is in looking out for you. I went to the Wharton School of Finance, and many of those professors, the top professors, think my plan is a brilliant plan. It's a great plan. It's a plan that's going to bring up our, our worth, our value as a country. It's going to make people want to be able to go and work and uh, create jobs and create a lot of good, solid money for our, comp for our country. And just to finish off, uh, she doesn't have a plan. She copied Biden's plan, and it's like four sentences, like run, spot, run. 
four sentences that are just, oh, we'll try and lower taxes. She doesn't have a plan. Take a look at her plan. She doesn't have a plan. Mr. President, I do want to drill down on something you both brought up. Uh, the vice president brought up uh, your tariffs. You responded, and let's drill down on this, because your plan is what she calls is essentially a national sales tax. Your proposal calls for tariffs, as you pointed out here, on foreign imports across the board. You recently said that you might double your plan, imposing tariffs up to 20 percent on goods coming into this country. As you know, many economists say that with tariffs at that level, costs are then passed on to the consumer. Vice President Harris has argued it'll mean higher prices on gas, food, clothing, medication, arguing it costs the typical family nearly $4,000 a year. Do you believe Americans can afford higher prices because of tariffs? They're not going to have higher prices. What's going to have and who's going to have higher prices is China and all of the countries that have been ripping us off for years. I charge, I was the only president ever. China was paying us hundreds of billions of dollars, and so were other countries. And, you know, if she doesn't like them, they should have gone out and they should have immediately cut the tariffs. But those tariffs are there three and a half years now under their administration. We are going to take in billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. I had no inflation, virtually no inflation. They had the highest inflation, perhaps, in the history of our country, because I've never seen a worse period of time. People can't go out and buy cereal or bacon or eggs or anything else. These, the people of our country are absolutely dying with what they've done. They've destroyed the economy. And all you have to do is look at a poll. The polls say 80 and 85 and even 90 percent that the Trump economy was great, that their economy was terrible. Vice President Harris, I do want to ask for your response. And you heard what the president said there, because the Biden administration did keep a number of the Trump tariffs in place. So how do you respond? Well, let's be clear that the Trump administration resulted in a trade deficit, one of the highest we've ever seen in the history of America. He invited trade wars. Hey guys, you want uh, to talk about his deal with China, what he ended up doing is under Donald Trump's presidency, he ended up selling American chips to China to help them improve and modernize their military, basically sold us out when a policy about China should be in making sure the United States of America wins the competition for the 21st century, which means focusing on the details of what that requires, focusing on relationships with our allies, focusing on investing in American-based technology so that we win the race on AI, on quantum computing, focusing on what we need to do to support America's workforce so that we don't end up having, the, the, on the short end of the stick, in terms of workers' rights. But what Donald Trump did, let's talk about this, with COVID, is he actually t thanked President Xi for what he did during COVID. Look at his tweet. Thank you, President Xi, exclamation point, when we know that Xi was responsible for lacking and not giving us transparency about the origins of COVID. President Trump, I'll let you respond. First of all, they bought their chips from Taiwan. We hardly make chips anymore because of uh, philosophies like they have and policies like they have. I don't say her because she has no policy. Everything that she believed three years ago and four years ago is out the window. She's going to my philosophy now. In fact, I was going to send her a MAGA hat. She's gone to my philosophy. But if she ever got elected, she'd change it. And it will be the end of our country. She's a Marxist. Everybody knows she's a Marxist. Her father's a Marxist professor in economics, and he taught her well. But when you look at what she's done to our country, and when you look at these millions and millions of people that are pouring into our country monthly, where it's, I believe, 21 million people, not the 15 that people say, and I think it's a lot higher than the 21, that's bigger than New York State pouring in. And just look at what they're doing to our country. They're criminals. Many of these people coming in are criminals. And that's bad for our economy, too. You know, you mentioned before, we'll talk about immigration later. Well, bad immigration is the worst thing that can happen to our economy. They have, and she has, destroyed our country with policy that's insane. Almost policy that you'd say they have to hate our country. President Trump, thank you. Lindsay. I want to turn to the issue of abortion. President Trump, you've often touted that you were able to kill Roe v. Wade last year. You said that you were proud to be the most pro-life president in American history. Then last month, you said that your administration would be great for women and their reproductive rights. 
in your home state of Florida. You surprised many uh, with regard to your six-week abortion ban because you initially had said that it was too short. And you said, quote, I'm going to be voting that we need more than six weeks. But then the very next day, you reversed course and said you would vote to support the six-week ban. Vice President Harris says that women shouldn't trust you on the issue of, of abortion because you've changed your position so many times. Therefore, why should they trust well, you? Well, the reason I'm doing that vote is because the plan is, as you know, the vote is they have abortion in the ninth month. They even have, and you can look at the governor of West Virginia, the previous governor of West Virginia, not the current governor, is doing an excellent job, but the governor before, he said the baby will be born and we will decide what to do with the baby. In other words, we'll execute the baby. And that's why I did that, because that predominates, because they're radical. The Democrats are radical in that. And her vice presidential pick, which I think was a horrible pick, by the way, for our country, because he is really out of it. But her vice presidential pick says abortion in the ninth month is absolutely fine. He also says execution after birth. It's execution, no longer abortion, because the baby is born is okay and that's not okay with me hence the vote but what i did is something for 52 years they've been trying to get roe v wade into the states and through the uh, genius and and heart and strength of six supreme court justices we were able to do that now i believe in the exceptions for rape incest and life of the mother i believe strongly in it ronald reagan did also 85% of Republicans do exceptions. Very important. But we were able to get it, and now states are voting on it. And for the first time, you're going to see, look, this is a, an issue that's torn our country apart for 52 years. Every legal scholar, every Democrat, every Republican, liberal, conservative, they all wanted this issue to be brought back to the states where the people could vote. And that's what happened. Happened. Now, Ohio? The vote was somewhat liberal. Kansas, the vote was somewhat liberal, much more liberal than people would have thought. But each individual state is voting. It's the vote of the people now. It's not tied up in the federal government. I did a great service in doing it. It took courage to do it. And the Supreme Court had great courage in doing it. And I give tremendous credit to those six justices. There is no state in this country where it is legal to kill a baby after it's born. Madam Vice President, I want to get your response to President Trump. Well, as I said, you're going to hear a bunch of lies. And that's not actually a surprising fact. Let's understand how we got here. Donald Trump hand-selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And they did exactly as he intended. And now in over 20 states, there are Trump abortion bans, which make it criminal for a doctor or nurse to provide health care. In one state, it provides prison for life. Trump abortion bans that make no exception even for rape and incest, which understand what that means. A survivor of a crime of violation to their body does not have the right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. That is immoral. And one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government, and Donald Trump certainly, should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. I have talked with women around our country. You want to talk about this is what people wanted? Pregnant women who want to carry a pregnancy to term, suffering from a miscarriage, being denied care in an emergency room because the health care providers are afraid they might go to jail and she's bleeding out in a car in the parking lot? She didn't want that. Her husband didn't want that. A 12 or 13 year old survivor of incest being forced to carry a pregnancy to term. They don't want that. And I pledge to you, when Congress passes a bill to put back in place the protections of Roe v. Wade as president of the United States, I will proudly sign it into law. But understand, if Donald Trump were to be reelected, he will sign a national abortion ban. Understand, in his Project 2025, there would be a national abortion a monitor that would be monitoring your pregnancies, your miscarriages. I think the American people believe that certain freedoms, in particular the freedom to make decisions about one's own body, should not be made by the government. Thank you, Vice President Harris. Well, there uh, she goes again. It's a lie. 
I'm not signing a ban, and there's no reason to sign a ban, because we've gotten what everybody wanted, Democrats, Republicans, and everybody else, and every legal scholar wanted it to be brought back into the states, and the states are voting, and it may take a little time, but for 52 years, this issue has torn our country apart, and they've wanted it back in the states, and I did something that nobody thought was possible. The states are now voting. What she says is an absolute lie. And as far as the abortion ban, no, I'm not in favor of abortion ban, but it doesn't matter because this issue has now been taken over by the states. Would you veto a national abortion ban if it came Well, I won't have to because, again, two things. Number one, she said she'll go back to Congress. She'll never get the vote. It's impossible for her to get the vote, especially now with the 50-50, essentially 50-50 in both Senate and the House. She's not going to get the vote. She can't get the vote. She won't even come close to it. So it's just talk. You know what it reminds me of when they said they're going to get student loans uh, terminated and it ended up being a total catastrophe. The student loans and then her, I, I think probably her boss, if you call him a boss, he spends all his time on the beach. But look, her boss went out and said, we'll do it again. We'll do it a different way. And he went out, got rejected again by the Supreme Court. So all these students got... Uh, taunted with this whole thing about this whole idea and how unfair that would have been part of the reason they lost to the millions and millions of people that had to pay off their student loans they didn't get it for free but they were saying it's the same way that they talked about that that they talk about abortion but if i could just get a yes or no because your running mate Jen jd vance has said that you would veto it if it did come to your desk well i didn't discuss it with uh, jd in all fairness uh, jd and I, I don't mind if he has a certain view, but I think he was speaking for me, but I really didn't. Look, we don't have to discuss it because she'd never be able to get it, just like she couldn't get student loans. They couldn't get student loans. They didn't even come close to getting student loans. They taunted young people and a lot of other people that had loans. They can never get this approved. So it doesn't matter what she says about going to Congress. Well, wonderful. Let's go to Congress. Do it. But the fact is that for years they wanted to get it out of Congress and out of the federal government. And we did something that everybody said couldn't be done. And now you have a vote of the people on abortion. Vice President Harris, want to give you your time to respond. But I do want to ask, would you support any restrictions on a woman's right to an abortion? I absolutely support reinstating the protections of Roe v. Wade. And as you rightly mentioned, nowhere in America is a woman carrying a pregnancy to term and, and, and asking for an abortion. That is not happening. It's insulting to the women of America. And understand what has been happening under Donald Trump's abortion bans. Couples who pray and, 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 and dream of having a family are being denied IVF treatments. What is happening in our country? Working people, working women, who are working one or two jobs, who can barely afford childcare as it is, have to travel to another state to get on a plane sitting next to strangers to go and get the health care she needs. Barely can afford to do it, and what you are putting her through is unconscionable. And the people of America have not, the majority of Americans believe in a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, and that is why in every state where this issue has been on the ballot in red and blue states votes, the people of America have voted for freedom. Vice President Excuse Harris, me, I have you. to respond. Another lie. It's another lie. I have been a leader on IVF, which, which is fertilization. The IVF, I have been a leader. In fact, when they got a very negative decision on IVF from the Alabama courts, I saw the people of Alabama and the legislature two days later voted it in. I've been a leader on it. They know that and everybody else knows it. I have been a leader on fertilization, IVF. And the other thing, they, you should ask, will she allow abortion in the eighth month, ninth month, seventh month? Okay, would you do that? Why don't you ask why, her that question? Why don't you answer That's the, the problem. question? Would you because veto? under Roe v. Wade, you, you, you could do abortions in the seventh month, the eighth month, 
the ninth That's month, and probably after birth. Just look at the governor, former governor of, of Virginia. The governor of Virginia said we put the baby aside and then we determine what we want to do with the baby. President Trump, thank you. We're going to turn now to immigration and border security. We know it's an issue that's important to Republicans, Democrats, voters across the board uh, in this country. Vice President Harris, you were tasked by President Biden with getting to the root causes of migration from Central America. We know that illegal border crossings reached a record high in the Biden administration. This past June, President Biden imposed tough new asylum restrictions. We know the numbers since then have dropped significantly. But my question to you tonight is why did the administration wait until six months before the election to act? And would you have done anything differently from President Biden on this? So I'm the only person on this stage who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations for the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. And let me say that the United States Congress, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Senate, came up with a border security bill, which I supported. And that bill would have put 1,500 more border agents on the border to help those folks who are working there right now overtime, trying to do their job. It would have allowed us to stem the flow of fentanyl coming into the United States. I know there are so many families watching tonight who have been personally affected by the surge of fentanyl in our country. That bill would have put more resources to allow us to prosecute transnational criminal organizations for trafficking in guns, drugs, and human beings. But you know what happened to that bill? Donald Trump got on the phone, called up some folks in Congress, and said, kill the bill. And you know why? Because he'd prefer to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And understand, this comes at a time where the people of our country actually need a leader who engages in solutions, who actually addresses the problems at hand. But what we have in the former president is someone who would prefer to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And I'll tell you something, he's going to talk about immigration a lot tonight, even when it's not the subject that is being raised. And I'm going to actually do something really unusual, and I'm going to invite you to attend one of Donald Trump's rallies, because it's a really interesting thing to watch. You will see during the course of his rallies, he talks about fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter. He will talk about windmills cause cancer. And what you will also notice is that people start leaving his rallies early out of exhaustion and boredom. And I will tell you, the one thing you will not hear him talk about is you. You will not hear him talk about your needs, your dreams, and your, need, and your desires. And I'll tell you, I believe you deserve a president who actually puts you first. And I pledge to you that I will. Vice President Harris, thank you. President Trump, on that point, I want to get your response. Well, I would like to respond. Let me just ask, though, why did you try to kill that bill? And successfully so, that would have put thousands of additional agents and officers on the board. First, let me respond as to the Please. rallies. She said people start leaving. People don't go to her rallies. There's no reason to go. And the people that do go, she's busing them in and paying them to be there and then showing them in a different light. So she can't talk about that. People don't leave my rallies. We have the biggest rallies, the most incredible rallies in the history of politics. That's because people want to take their country back. Our country is being lost. We're a failing nation. And it happened three and a half years ago. And what, what's going on here, you're going to end up in World War III, just to go into another subject. What they have done to our country by allowing these millions and millions of people to come into our country and look at what's happening to the towns all over the United States. And a lot of towns don't want to talk. It's not going to be Aurora or Springfield. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country, and it's a shame. As far as rallies are concerned, as far as the reason they go is they like what I say. They want to bring our country back. They want to make America great again. It's a very simple phrase, make America great again. She's destroying this country, and if she becomes president, this country doesn't have a chance of success. Not only success, we'll end up being Venezuela on steroids. I just want to clarify here, you bring up Springfield, uh, Ohio, and, and ABC News did reach out to the city manager there. Uh, he told us there had been no credible reports of specific claims of pets being harmed, injured, or abused by individuals within the immigrant community. Well, All I've this, seen people on television. Let me just say here, this is the... But people on television say my dog was taken and used for food. So 
maybe he said that, and maybe that's a good yeah. thing to say for a city manager. I'm not taking this from but television. But the people I'm on television are saying the their dog was eaten by the people that went there. Again, the Springfield city manager says there's no evidence of that. Vice we'll President find Harris, out. I'll let you respond to the rest of what you've heard. <laughs> Talk about extreme. <laughs> um, you know, I, this is, I think, one of the reasons why in this election I actually have the endorsement of 200 Republicans who have formally worked with President Bush, Mitt Romney, and John McCain, including the endorsement of former Vice President Dick Cheney and Congress member Liz Cheney. And if you want to really know the inside track on who the former president is, if he didn't make it clear already, just ask people who have worked with him. His former chief of staff, a four-star general, has said he has contempt for the Constitution of the United States. His former national security advisor has said he is dangerous and unfit. His former secretary of defense has said the nation, the republic, would never survive another Trump term. And when we listen to this kind of rhetoric, when the issues that affect the American people are not being addressed, I think the choice is clear in this election. President Trump, I'll give you a quick minute to respond. Yeah. Uh, thank you, because when I hear that, see, I'm a different kind of a person. I fired most of those people. Not so graciously. They did bad things or a bad job. I fired them. They never fired one person. They didn't fire anybody having to do with Afghanistan and the Taliban and the 13 people who's, who's, were just killed, viciously and violently killed. And I got to know the parents and the family. They didn't fire. They should have fired all those generals, all those top people, because that was one of the most incompetently handled situations anybody has ever seen. So when somebody does a bad job, I fire him. And you take a guy like Esper. He was no good. I fired him. So he writes a book. Another one writes a book. Because with me, they can write books. With nobody else, can they? But they have done such a poor job. And they never fire anybody. Look at the economy. Look, how, look at the inflation. They didn't fire any of their economists. They have the same people. That's a good way not to have books written about you. But just to finish, I got more votes than any Republican in history by far. In fact, I got more votes than any president, sitting president, in history by far. Let me continue on immigration. It was what you wanted to talk about earlier, so let's get back to your deportation uh, uh, proposal that the vice president has reacted to as well. Uh, president Trump, you call this the largest domestic deportation operation in the history of our country. You say you would use the National Guard. You say if things get out of control, you'd have uh, no problem using the U.S. With military. Yes. Uh, you also said you would use local police. Uh, how would you uh, deport 11 million undocumented immigrants? I know you, you believe that number is, is much higher. Uh, take us through this. What does this look like? Will authorities be going door to door in this country? Yeah, it is much higher because of them. They allowed criminals, many, many millions of criminals. They allowed terrorists. They allowed common street criminals. They allowed people to come in, drug dealers, to come into our country. And they're now in the United States and told by their countries like Venezuela, don't ever come back or we're going to kill you. Do you know that crime in Venezuela and crime in countries all over the world is way down? You know why? Because they've taken their criminals off the street and they've given them to her to put into our country. And this will be one of the greatest mistakes in history for them to allow. And I think they probably did it because they think they're gonna get votes, but it's not worth it because they're, they're destroying the fabric of our country by what they've done. There's never been anything done like this at all. They've destroyed the fabric of our country. Millions of people let in. And all over the world, crime is down. All over the world except here. Crime here is up and through the roof. Despite their fraudulent statements that they made, crime in this country is through the roof. And we have a new form of crime. It's called migrant crime. And it's happening at levels that nobody thought possible. President Trump, as you know, the FBI says overall violent crime is actually coming down in this country. But Excuse President me, Harris the FBI defraud, they were defrauding statements. They, they didn't include the worst cities. They didn't include the cities with the worst crime. It was a, a fraud. Just like their number of 818,000 jobs that they said they created turned out to be a fraud. President Trump, thank you. I'll let you respond, Vice President. Well, I think this is so rich, coming from someone who has been prosecuted for 
national security crimes, economic crimes, election interference, has been found liable for sexual assault, and his next big court appearance is in November at his own criminal sentencing. And let's be clear, where each person stands on the issue of what is important about respect for the rule of law and respect for law enforcement, the former vice president called for defunding federal law enforcement, 45,000 agents, get this, on the day after he was arraigned on 34 felony counts. So let's talk about what is important in this race. It is important that we move forward, that we turn the page on this same old tired rhetoric and address the needs of the American people, address what we need to do about the housing shortage, which I have a plan for, address what we must do to support our small businesses, address bringing down the price of groceries. But frankly, the American people are exhausted with this same old tired playbook. Vice President Harris, thank you. Excuse me. Every one of those cases was started by them against their political opponent. And I'm winning most of them, and I will win the rest on appeal. And you saw that with the decision that came down just recently from the Supreme Court. I'm winning most of them. But those are cases, it's called weaponization. Never happened in this country. They weaponized the Justice Department. Every one of those cases was involved with the DOJ, from Atlanta and Fawny Willis to, to the... Uh, Attorney General of New York and the DA in New York, every one of those cases, and then they say, oh, he was he's a criminal. They're the ones that made them go after me. By the way, Joe Biden was found essentially guilty on the documents case. And what happened in my documents case? They said, oh, that's the toughest of them all. A complete and total victory. Two months ago, it was thrown out. It's weaponization, and they used it, and it's never happened in this country. They used it to try and win an election. President They're Trump. fake cases. President Trump, thank you. A really quick response here, Vice President Harris, on this notion of weaponization of the Justice Department. Well, let's talk about extreme and understand the context in which this election in 2024 is taking place. The United States Supreme Court recently ruled that the former president would essentially be immune from any misconduct if he were to enter the White House again. Understand that this is someone who openly said he would terminate, I'm quoting, terminate the Constitution of the United States.